My name is Saul Wiener, and I'm an internist and a pediatrician, and this is the first of several videos on the topic of contextualizing care. I first got interested in this topic almost 20 years ago when I was a junior attending, uh, supervising medical students and residents, and one of the things I noticed is that while they were getting better and better at knowing the latest research evidence for managing a variety of clinical conditions, uh, oftentimes when we walked into uh, the patient's room, whether it was on the inpatient or the outpatient side, we would learn that the patient was struggling with a variety of life challenges that we needed to know about in order to plan effective care. Uh, so for instance, uh, it might be that the patient had lost their health insurance and couldn't afford the medications that we uh, planned to give them, and we would need to find some sort of less costly workaround. Or it could be that the patient had uh, developed arthritic fingers or their vision was failing and they couldn't dose insulin uh, safely and we would need, for instance, to, uh, to prescribe pre-filled syringes. Um, or, or it could be that they uh, couldn't make it to appointments because they were now working the night shift and we would have to take that into account for their care plan to be safe and effective. So it became clear to me that this was a quality issue and one that's easy to overlook because if you just look at the patient's medical record, it reflects the logic of the healthcare professional, typically the physician, sometimes nurses, and others on the care team. Uh, and unless you'd been a fly on the wall in the patient's room, you wouldn't have known that uh, the care plan that you saw in the medical record was probably not going to be effective for that patient. So uh, with these challenges in mind, I banded together with a colleague, Alan Schwartz, who's a cognitive psychologist. And we have been studying contextualization of care for many years. Uh, we started by you know, employing unannounced standardized patients. Uh, these are actors who portray patients, and we got permission from physicians uh, that we could send these patients into their practices and record visits covertly. And then we moved from there to inviting uh, real patients to carry uh, concealed audio recorders into their appointments, again, uh, with consent of participating healthcare professionals. Uh, we started with physicians, and then we added nurses and clinical pharmacists, uh, and even front desk clerks. And so in the next few videos, I'll be sharing with you uh, some of what we've learned from these studies. Uh, we've learned how important contextualization of care is uh, to patient healthcare outcomes and uh, even to costs. And we've been looking at ways to improve uh, contextualization of care skills uh, among a variety of healthcare professionals who we've worked with. So uh, uh, this first video is on a foundational topic, which is uh, what do we mean by uh, uh, patient life context? And, uh, and then in subsequent vid videos, we're going to be building on that basic concept uh, to look at this whole topic of contextualization of care. So thank you for your interest, and uh, let's get started. So what do we mean by patient life context? And I, I should mention that I've put the word life in parentheses because we tend to drop it and just say patient context. But so that you're very clear about what I'm talking about here, I want to introduce it as patient life context so that you understand that we're actually talking about the patient's life. We have two definitions, and these definitions are intended to be quite specific. The first one, which I refer to as a precise definition, is that patient life context is everything that is expressed outside of a patient's skin that is relevant to planning their care. And I want to hone in on two words in this definition. The first is relevant. And what I want to emphasize here is that when you're taking care of a patient, it's unrealistic to get to know everything about what's going on in that person's life, uh, particularly if you only have 15 or 20 minutes. But I think what we do have a responsibility to do is figure out if there's something relevant to planning their care that were we to overlook, the care plan would fall short of what we're aiming to accomplish. So for instance, if a patient is unable to take a medication because they depend on a caregiver, or if they lack the financial means to pay for medication, or if, for instance, they have some sort of cognitive deficit and they're unable to understand a treatment plan, that's all going to be relevant life context. The other word that I want to emphasize from this definition is the word expressed outside of a patient's skin. So again, the word expressed here is the one I'd like to single out. The idea here is that when we're thinking about a person's patient life context, we can really break it down into two broad areas. First, there's literally the stuff that's going on outside their skin, which is the financial situation, the presence of a caregiver, 
uh, the responsibilities that they have that could get in the way of their ability to manage their own needs. That's literally physically outside of the person's skin. But then there's also stuff that's going on inside of them, like their emotional state, their attitude towards their illness, which is going to express itself in how they behave. And that's also going to be life context. So for instance, if you're caring for a patient who's lost control of their diabetes, and the underlying reason is that they are depressed or that uh, their fingers have become arthritic and they can't uh, dose their insulin correctly or they're developing cognitive deficits. All that is actually driven by what's, what's happening inside of them, but it's the way it's expressed in their behavior that is ultimately what matters here. So that's why the word expressed is included in the definition of patient context. And then underneath this precise definition, I have what I call the good enough definition, uh, which is patient or caregiver circumstances and behaviors that are relevant to planning care. And I, I think you can see how these two are similar. Uh, the, the circumstances is all the stuff that's going on literally outside their skin. And the behavior re refers to the stuff that's going on inside of them. Again, the emotion, the skills and abilities, and so forth that affect how they actually behave in ways that have direct relevance to planning their care. So again, we've got a precise definition and a good enough definition. We originally started with a precise definition, but when we were publishing one of our early papers, one of the journals just thought it was too weird sounding, uh, this whole reference to outside of the skin. And so hence we came up with a sort of more naturalistic definition, which is pretty good and pretty close. So I'd like to now introduce this concept uh, with a case. Uh, Mary Garcia is a 46-year-old Spanish-speaking woman with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, secondary to diabetes and hypertension, who presented to the emergency department at Average Medical Center, AVC, with evidence of generalized edema and mild shortness of breath. She had missed her last hemodialysis session. In the emergency room, her potassium was 6.8 with peak T waves on electrocardiogram and her blood pressure was 156 over 77. So this would be a pretty typical presentation for somebody who has missed a few hemodialysis sessions. We see abnormalities of uh, a critical electrolyte, which in turn is creating a dangerous situation with her heart. Uh, we're seeing the effect of fluid overload on an increased blood pressure. So appropriately, the first thing her physicians did in the emergency room is approach this through a fairly narrow biomedical perspective. They gave her calcium gluconate, which basically stabilizes the heart from potential for a lethal arrhythmia. Uh, they gave her insulin and glucose. We think of insulin as a medication for diabetes, but it's also useful for driving potassium into cells. And of course, once you do that, you have to offset the insulin with glucose. Uh, they gave her sodium polystyrene sulfonate, and this is a medication that helps stool out potassium. And then finally, hemodialysis, which is the definitive care, of course, that she needed. So she was discharged the next day, and the note said that the patient was apprised of, quote, the risk of missing hemodialysis sessions and urge of the importance of compliance, close quote. So you may not be surprised to hear that this patient came back again, and then again, and then again, and each time it was pretty much the same situation with her missing hemodialysis and her needing a fairly urgent intervention, and then her going home the next day with instructions uh, to do better the next time. And patients like this are often pejoratively labeled uh, frequent flyers. So I think one of the downsides, in addition to just being not very nice, of labeling somebody a frequent flyer or just non-compliant, is it kind of shuts down curiosity. Once you've assigned a label to a patient, you're less likely to ask yourself questions like, what might be going on in this person's life or in their head that could account for what seems like irrational behavior? It wasn't until the fourth admission that a fourth year medical student asked her what was going on. This medical student happened to speak Spanish. Uh, the others who had cared for her may not have spoken Spanish. They certainly could have gotten an interpreter. And the fact that there was a language barrier may have uh, further contributed to no one looking into what might be going on. So once a student started to talk to Ms. Garcia, a story emerged, uh, what we would refer to as the patient context. It turns out that she is the primary caretaker of a 10-year-old grandson with an unrelated renal condition, a glomerular disease. She often had to choose between taking him to a nephrologist north of her home at Average Medical Center or going to hemodialysis south of her home. She relied on a Medicaid van, which would only go from home to healthcare facility. Like many good grandmothers, uh, she prioritized her grandson's care over her own. So she was basically in a bind. She lived south of AVC, 
uh, which was where her grandson got care and where she would turn up when she missed hemodialysis. And she lived north of the community-based hemodialysis site. And the van, which was responsible for taking her from her home to a medical facility, could not take her or would not take her from one medical facility to another. So she would have to make an impossible decision. And once this information emerged, the care team consulted a social worker who worked with the dialysis unit and her hemodialysis was moved from the community-based site to AVC so that she would no longer have to choose between bringing her grandson to AVC and getting her own medical needs met, and there were no more ED visits in the 12 months after that intervention uh, when we followed her. So I think this illustrates how important patient life context is and what happens when we overlook it. I find this diagram to be quite helpful. It takes the discussion we've been having to 30,000 feet, and I often share this diagram with medical residents and medical students, and you can, if, if you're a healthcare professional, you can put yourself in the center here and think about the importance of considering four different types of information whenever you're with a patient. The first, of course, is the clinical state. That's all the biomedical stuff that you elicit from taking a history. And then, of course, you want to use your expert knowledge, which hopefully is based on research evidence, uh, when you manage that clinical state. So this is what we know from randomized controlled trials and all sorts of other studies that make up the corpus of medical knowledge that we use to manage whatever we're managing, whether it's diabetes or pneumonia or heart attack. And unfortunately, many clinicians restrict their role to simply eliciting a clinical state and applying the research evidence. But I think it's important to remember that there are two other types of information that may be part of any medical encounter. The third, of course, is patient context, which is what we're talking about today. And we see how important that is with a patient like Ms. Garcia. And then the fourth is patient preferences. And I think this is more of an ethical issue when there are choices to be made about, for example, how to treat a condition that have implications for a patient's quality of life. It behooves us not to just make that decision without consulting the patient because they're the experts on what's important to them, on what risks they're willing to take, on what trade-offs they're willing to make. And so that's why patient preferences should be thought of as one of the four essential types of information that we need to consider when managing patient care. The ability to not only elicit but integrate all this information is really what we mean by clinical decision making. A mentor of mine, Simon Oster, I think put it best when he said, clinical decision making is the process of answering the question, what is the best next thing for this patient at this time? And you can see the way I said it, that I'm emphasizing the word this twice. So this patient is intended to highlight the fact that every person's life is different and that when we're trying to elicit patient context, we're trying to figure out what is it that's highly specific to this person so that we have enough granularity to enable us to do ultimately what's best for them. And the second this refers to at this time. And I think that highlights the fact that even if we think we know a patient well, at each visit, something might have happened between when you last saw them and when you're seeing them today that could have changed their patient life context. A family member may have become ill. They may have gotten a job. There may have been some sort of financial setback. Who knows? And that's why the emphasis is not only on this particular individual, but this particular individual at this time. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to what I think is a sort of contextual differential. What we see here is a list of broad domains of life context. The six on the left pertain to life circumstances, and the six on the right are drivers of behavior. So if you think back to the definitions I gave you earlier, you'll see that these sort of map onto them. This is stuff that's literally outside of the skin. So a, a patient's loss of transportation or loss of health insurance would present an access to care issue. A competing responsibility could either be something good, like getting a new job, or it could be something unfortunate, like having to care for a sick family member and no longer being able to care for yourself. And the ones on the right, uh, again, are things happening inside that person but are drivers of behavior. So for instance, emotional state. So I hope this has given you a broad understanding of what we mean by patient life context and an appreciation for why contextual information is one of the four essential types of information that we need to take into account when planning patient care. I hope you'll join me in our next video as we start to apply this concept of patient life context to the process of contextualizing care.